I'd like to talk to you about how we make these prosthetic legs, that is, legs for people who don't have a part of their uh, body, that cost just a few dollars, that is lightweight, flexible, that people can not just walk and work with, but they can also run, play, and dance. So much so that even when we went to international competitions and competed with prosthetic legs that cost $70,000 and $100,000, that we held our own. And with almost having no budget, uh, or no money to call a budget, we were able to be covered by BBC, CNN, History Channel. A video of ours got over 12 to 13 million views. All this without a PR campaign or a communications team. Now, I, as a mechanical engineer, studied how animals and robots walk and run. Now, very simply put, the leg is functionally or mathematically a spring. Whether you're an elephant or an ant, or whether you have hundreds of legs like a centipede, or two legs like a human, the leg is essentially a spring. Now, it turns out that even you have this cane furniture that's bent in all these beautiful shapes that uh, you can sit in, now, if it's bent and you can sit and can take your weight, essentially that's a spring in itself. So now, if, if the cane is a spring and the human leg is a spring, it was a curious to be question as to whether I could make a leg out of cane. So now, not having worked with uh, cane uh, before, I went and spoke to a couple of um, local artisans to see whether we could bend cane about this shape, whether it could take the weight, and they were like, yeah, it, it, it quite can do the job. So now, to, to better understand this, to rapid prototype and just get my hands dirty, I essentially bunched together a couple of sticks of cane and then put it on a parapet, had somebody stand on one end, and I just step on it to see whether it can take my weight. And it takes my weight well, and it doesn't break. So I was like, all right, so it quite, quite works. So then I went ahead and then made uh, another prototype that's just a simple, functional prototype, a looks-like prototype, that it's not rated to take human weight, but then at least it's a prototype that I could go and talk to the stakeholders to better understand what do they think about this, because I've never worked with prosthetics before. So I went to doctors and amputees to hear their thoughts, and I was surprised how amputees readily understood this. In fact, one of them said uh, that he used to play badminton before the accident, and now with, uh, with the current prosthetic leg, he just can't play badminton because the leg is heavy and it's not flexible. And with this, he can, this is just qu uh, quite what he needed. But then all of them have the concern, it's wood. Can it really take the weight? Will it break? And I thought that's a reasonable concern. So then, again, as a mechanical guy, I went to multiple mechanical labs looking for machines that could just uh, help me figure out could cane uh, take the weight. But then it turns out that mechanical labs don't have appropriate machines because cane is a composite, and that's not the domain they work in. I eventually ended up at the aerospace department at the Indian Institute of Science, wherein they had, given that they work with carbon fiber, which is a composite, Cane being a natural composite, they had the machines that could help me figure out and characterize cane. And we were really surprised how surprisingly well cane worked. Now, that being said, I didn't want to just make a leg that just about worked where people could just about walk. I wanted something where people could not just walk, but run, play, and dance. So, I went about searching for amputees that had a penchant for sports. I put the word out, and eventually I ended up with Madhu. He's a child who lost both his legs and, need, and currently wears two prosthetic legs, but also needs two uh, crutches to walk with. And after connecting with world-class coaches, trained, he was able to do, uh, train for the TCS 10K marathon, wherein he could walk without crutches. And now, he was like, well, this is fine. This, the, you know, I can walk with this. It's lightweight and flexible. But, you know, I can't take this to home or I can't take it to college because the leg looks weird. 
And I don't want people to talk about my leg. I just want to go about and have a normal life. And we're like, that's right. So then we went ahead and then developed these cosmetic covers that make it look more like a leg. And then we also d in, uh, innovated uh, on the skin covers, wherein it's this digitally printed skin texture that can be color matched to the person's skin tone, making it very realistic looking. But at the same time, we could use that technology to even develop these art covers, wherein people could uh, express themselves. And what happened is we realized that this is not just a leg that people can walk with, but it also became an aspirational device where people could pursue matters or, uh, or sports that they otherwise couldn't. So then we created what we call the programs, you know, the sports program, the dance program, where we encourage amputees to take up these activities and we connect them with world-class facilities. In fact, we have amputees who've uh, taken up dancing, taken up uh, sports like marathons. In fact, one of them uh, took up bodybuilding. And now Prajwal, he's a fitness trainer to able-bodied people. And we also had the opportunity to go to Switzerland, wherein we had to compete with um, international teams that came in with $70,000 prosthetic legs, $100,000 prosthetic legs uh, at this obstacle race called Cybathlon. It's held alongside the Olympics. And despite having a leg that cost just a few dollars, we were able to time first in two out of the three races. Now, now uh, along with this, we were able to, uh, from here we went on to work with world-class organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, with MIT Boston, to further develop and refine the device wherein we can now cater to the masses and genuinely solve the problem in a much larger and impactful manner. And also, not just wanting to make a lightweight, cost-effective prosthetic leg, but also ensure that the leg is delivered and, uh, and cost-effectively executed. We work with frontline organizations like the Association of People with Disability, with Century, and among so many others that already have the infrastructure. So we don't have to spend money in fabrication or, uh, or, or all those facilities. That all that cost savings, we pass it on to our customer. And in return, the frontline grassroots organizations, they are able to make more impact per dollar and also improve their reach and efficiency. Now, call this a lean startup, call it frugal innovation, but the underlying premise is that it is to look at frugality of resources as a creative constraint to tackle problems and come up with alternative solutions. Now, I want to stress that by definition, you, the solutions through frugal innovation or creative constraint need not be subpar or jugard-like. With adequate thought, they can still be elegant and world-class. Sure, or on average, they might be less complex or sophisticated, but they can still be nuanced. And this is not just applicable to hardware, but also systemic design and process design. In fact, with, uh, I, I contend that that we look at frugal innovation not just from a fiscal conservative, uh, uh, conservative point of view, but then also to holistically encompass frugality in spaces, resources, manpower, time. The goal is to genuinely solve a problem and not just create another solution. Now, in today's day and age about how we are, uh, you know, we are facing dwindling resources, especially in, uh, in a time of uh, FMCGs, of, um, of uh, disposable uh, consumeristic markets. I think there is, uh, it is time that frugal innovation not just be a fringe design thinking process, but rather it be mainstreamed to genuinely use the the dwindling resources that are out there. I mean, look at it from a perspective of a startup and a company. A startup has 
few, uh, on an average, they have fewer uh, people, they have few resources, and they are at the width end to, uh, to come up with innovative solutions, creative ideas, by which they can survive the existing market dynamics. Companies, on the other hand, they have more resources, more people, but yes, they are less agile, less creative, less innovative. But now it's interesting as to how companies are taking on frugal innovation, wherein companies like Renault, Nissan, Amazon, um, Facebook, Google, they are artificially constraining their teams. They, put, they start off with micro teams, they start off with uh, limited timelines and budgets, and heaven or hell, figure it out. I mean, do, um, hackathons are frugal innovation in itself. So I contend that, especially as freelancers, entrepreneurs, startups, companies, it's important to look at frugal innovation or creative constraints as not as a rest restrictive or a negative um, constraint, but rather as a conduit for creative, uh, creative thoughts. In fact, in fact, it's possible, in fact, it's not just possible, but rather there are th studies about how uh, constraints actually lead to more uh, richer designs and uh, innovative solutions. Furthermore, to end this talk, with the advent of technology today, it's absolutely possible to do more with less. Thank you. <laughs>